If I ask you to list 5 bits of information about COVID-19 that you have encountered on the internet, it will take you less than a minute to complete the task. The reason is simple. While COVID-19 is not the first pandemic the world has known, it is the first to exist in the age of technological and information explosion. Hi there. You're listening to Unviral, the podcast where we tackle that dangerous combination of the two kinds of virality. Misinformation about health. I'm Parvati Mohan, production lead at Factly, and in this episode, we talk about COVID-19. In most of our episodes, we have taken a health issue and spoken about the myths around it. But this episode is going to be different. Our focus is more on the communication channels around this disease. Who are the people who are putting out information about it? What are the linkages between these stakeholders? and how we should be consuming this information overload that comes our way with the onset of lockdowns across the globe people turned towards social media to stay connected with one another in some cases social media truly rose to the occasion by helping those who had been laid off find jobs and by providing timely information about the availability of oxygen cylinders during the shortage crisis india faced in the second wave of the pandemic but there was a flip side to the increased engagement with social media too covid-19 is a new disease at the time of recording this podcast it is not even 2 years since the first case was reported when there is so much that we don't know about health conditions that have existed for years like cancer and migraine how can we presume to know everything there is to know about covid-19 but ignorance is not the impression we get when we go through social media platforms The experts out there share lots of tips about dealing with the disease from what causes it to how to cure it. Joining me now to talk about this infodemic that runs parallelly with the pandemic is the Factly Facebook Health Fellow Nandita Kalidas. Does your research give any clues about how social media has become such a big player in this situation Nandita? Yes. So in March 2020 life as we know it had drastically changed and come to a standstill. all the countries and especially a country like india with this kind of a mammoth population had gone into a complete lockdown and there was widespread uncertainty so in this chasm of uncertainty social media had become a medium of hope for people to make sense of say what is happening within and outside the country and they were all trying to piece the puzzle together so this way a lot of information was shared in a hope that something out there will prove to be useful but instead what happened unfortunately is that misinformation was amplified and to that extent that it has become a threat to public health while the same medium kept people safe connected informed and engaged the other side of the social media has jeopardized the diffusion of information see a lot of information especially misinformation is very attention grabbing and emotional by that i mean to say people shared and subscribed to things given that they thought that this will help someone and unknowingly they became the propagators of fake news people often laud social media for how it has democratized content anybody with an internet connection and an entry level smartphone can post content that can be accessed by people around the world but this abundance of opinion may not be a great thing for health issues Telling us why is Professor K Vishwanath, the Lee Kum Kee Professor of Health Communication at the Harvard T H Chan School of Public Health. Ten years ago, fifteen years ago, maybe twenty years ago, the media, you in the media, were producers and gatekeepers of information, right? You went and talked to scientists. You went and talked to doctors. You went and talked to politicians and govern uh, government folks. You attended a press conference. then you come back you wrote a story and you published that story and you made a decision what facts go into that story right so you were the producer and then you disseminated that information now a lay person can be a producer and disseminator of information that means the power has shifted from you to this lay person with tiktok and other social media i can produce my own video that's what i'm saying right and then i can put it on the internet and i see this oh this is a doctor video you should definitely must hear i don't even know if this person is really a doctor right just because i'm say i'm so dr vishwanath 
okay, I have a PhD, but I can easily say, I'm Dr. Vishwanath and start talking nonsense, right? So we can't eliminate misinformation. It's not possible. It's not, it's difficult. What we can do is put some systems in place, just as Factly is doing, in continuously anticipating and monitoring and surveilling. Nandita, I'd like to talk about this point that Professor Vishwanath made, which is that a person with a PhD can go online and say anything by virtue of holding the title of doctor. In our discussions on this topic, you spoke about how even a few medical doctors or people impersonating medical practitioners have made false claims on COVID-19 that went viral. Can you go through a few of these examples for our listeners? Sure. See, essentially, misinformation has manifested itself in multiple ways. For instance, we used to initially get WhatsApp forwards with like, say, a WHO or an ICMR logo that doctors from these prestigious organizations are insisting on certain cures or diet or that doctors had said that masks and social distancing are not required. I mean, even before COVID-19 vaccines have come into picture, uh, the first phase of misinformation was that most of these uh, so-called doctors were in denial of COVID-19. They said that it is a simple flu or that it did not exist or that this is a man-made conspiracy, so on and so forth. Once the COVID-19 vaccines are in place, then the anti-vaccine movement had started and they have been claiming multiple consequences like impotency and death for these vaccines and that it is not required and that these vaccines will do more harm than uh, do any good to the patient, so on and so forth. But one doctor who has owned the misinformation space on COVID-19 is Dr. Bishwaru Roy Chowdhury. He's a self-proclaimed doctor who claims to hold an honorary PhD in diabetes studies. And he's been an ardent anti-vaccination campaigner in India. So from conspiracy theories that COVID-19 is not real to diets that can cure mild to severe COVID-19 cases, he has covered it all. And there are multiple other con doctors like say, for instance, Dr. Tarun Khotari, among others, who believe that COVID-19 is just a simple flu or there are conspiracy theories that it's the result of pharmaceutical companies or rich people's conspiracy and uh, they're trying to depopulate the world. I mean, the conspiracy theories list is unending. So, for instance, once he acknowledged that COVID-19 is real, he was in fact quick to jump to the conclusion that people are dying not because of COVID-19 virus, but because of the treatment at the hospital, that you contract coronavirus at the hospital site, among other things. In reality, it is important to acknowledge that he's a quack and in no way a subject matter expert on COVID-19. In fact, YouTube, Twitter and Facebook had banned Mr. Chowdhury last year, but not before he assembled an army of followers, nearly 1 million followers on YouTube alone, before his account was deleted. And in fact, till date, his posts are widely shared by his followers on proxy accounts and this is the extent of misinformation that we are dealing with. Even when so-called representatives of the medical community put out information, we have to be mindful of where it is coming from. Professor Vishwanath explains why. When 10 studies are published over 10 months, six of them agree with findings and four of them may not agree because that's the way science works. Science is a self-correcting mechanism, right? And, And so they are to look for that consensus. Right. So I can go to the Journal of American Medical Association and say there is a new article that has come out, which says drug X seems to be effective. That's great. Okay. so what is the lay person, non-technical person's understanding of the drug? What is the trial? You know, who is funding that trial? What are the data saying? I would you don't have to know sophisticated statistics. What you need to know is something about the design of that study, you know. Is it just one study? Is it two studies? Is it 10 studies? Just because one study is reporting something doesn't mean those findings are durable, right? You know, tomorrow there will be another study which will disprove that. So you might want to wait four or five studies because uh, even on WhatsApp, I see lay people spreading information on some drug that has been proved to be effective. No, you know, just don't rely on one study alone. So know something about the design principles of research. Go to these reliable sources and and look at what is the consensus in the source. You know, so they might contradict each other, but the overall consensus, and then you report on the consensus. 
Professor Vishwanath spoke about the importance of consulting multiple sources before reaching a conclusion on any health issue. Given that the media and the scientific community are the two main sources of health-related knowledge for the public, it is worthwhile to understand how these two entities interact with each other and how the media presents medical or scientific information to the layperson. Do you have any interesting case studies about this, Nandita? Right. In a pandemic, it is very crucial and important that the scientific community and the media fraternity work in synergy. And especially when it comes to the added layers of misinformation, is this fear that is spread through vernacular media reports because they have these captivating headlines written and they're mostly reported without scientific understanding. Say, for instance, there was this preliminary study conducted by the ICMR scientists on, say, about uh, 274 samples of breakthrough infections. Breakthrough infections is when a person tests positive after the two doses. This happened in Odisha. And the study was misrepresented by projecting that the vaccines were ineffective against the uh, new variants. See, there are breakthrough cases across the world for all the vaccines. Now, what should have instead be reported is how effective these vaccines are at preventing the most severe impact of the virus and its ripple effects more importantly in terms of hospitalization, economic fallout, disease burden and mortality. The preprint study also highlighted the need to monitor the emergence of vaccine escaping variants and accordingly plan the next steps of the vaccine development. And similarly, a number of preliminary studies have been conducted on the results of the mixing of the two vaccines and uh, they have already hit the headlines without adequate peer review or further monitoring of the sampling size. And the onus is on uh, both the stakeholders because one can't function without the other. You need the scientific facts from the scientific community because the science is evolving as we speak and tomorrow there might be a completely new breakthrough that will probably come across. So it's very important for the media to understand what the scientific facts are and it is also important for them to say that we don't know everything but this is what we know and this is what we present to you. So it is not needed to sensationalize everything. At the same time, it is important to break down the scientific jargon into simpler terms for a layman to understand what is happening. Now that we know who some of the stakeholders in health communication are, let us understand from Professor Vishwanath how these sectors should prepare themselves. One of the best practices I just mentioned is surveillance system, information surveillance system. Unfortunately, governments have not been doing a good job. You see, our communication systems around risk and disease Communication systems, I'm talking about, not the epidemiological systems. Our communication systems are built for 20th century environment. What we have is a 21st century problem, right? So the first thing we need to do is bring our communication systems in the government into 21st century, right? Ecosystem, media ecosystem. That's one thing we need to do, I think, to really put something in place. And number two, we really need to train reporters. We have to invest in reporters on science communication, communication of science and health. We have to build capabilities and capacities, you know, which means skills and the systems. We have to put them in place so that, you know, it's easy to blame the journalists for getting one story wrong, one fact wrong. But the question you have to ask is, what? how have you helped the journalist to get it right, right? Especially if you're running writing three stories, four stories a day, right? So we have to have a system in place and the skills in place, you know. Uh, So the government has to have a communication system that is 21st century. You have to build systems within the media, you know, capabilities and capacities. And then we have systems, we have to provide healthcare providers, whoever they are, you know, some ways of how to communicate. Most of them don't know how to communicate. They're not expected to communicate, right? I mean, they they will tell you, oh, you have problem X, Y, and Z, and you should do this. But that kind of a com- engagement with the patient, right? Most patients are compliant, but there are some eighty percent of the patients, you know, are compliant. But there's a twenty percent of the patients who take eighty percent of the time of physicians, you know. And so, how? Do you, but you can't blame the physicians or other healthcare providers. You have to provide them the systems and support for that. Then we have to work with NGOs. NGOs are very critical because they are working in the trenches. How do you provide help to them 
so that they can communicate risk in a reliable way. So we have to come to 21st century. We have to work with the stakeholders. It's not one group's problem. Indeed. Health communication is not one group's problem. We have already spoken about the roles of the media and the scientific community in this area, but there is another side to all of this. People are often more comfortable getting advice from someone they know and trust rather than from reading about it in a news report quoting a doctor or scientist far away from them. To that effect, it is important to build a network of people at the grassroots who will communicate verified information to the common people in their language and in a way that they understand easily. Tell us why this is important, Nandita. Right. So if you see on the spectrum of, say, a metropolitan to the tribal communities, misinformation has manifested over the months. And each of this geography and community face a different problem statement when it comes to, say, something like vaccine hesitancy. And there is no one-size-fits-all approach. So, this is where local stakeholders are very significant in addressing the local community problems. Because they are the actors who understand the social, behavioral linguistic and practical norms of their respective regions. So say for instance, let me take the example of vaccine hesitancy. A lot of local community stakeholders played a huge role in the vaccination uptake so far. Like be it in uh, Bikaner in Rajasthan had uh, organized a door-to-door uh, vaccination campaign or that teachers in Tamil Nadu are actually coming out performing skits to educate people that vaccines are actually good for them and that they have to take vaccines. They have designed local strategies according to the local problem statement. So this is where local stakeholders become very important and it is imperative to curate and adopt local solutions. And this can happen only through the efforts of these uh, actors, including the local government, say from district collectors to the panchayats, civil society organizations, teachers, healthcare workers, What the ASHA workers have been doing has been phenomenal and has been a huge reason why the vaccine uptake has been going uh, the way we have been seeing doctors, nurses, local influencers, religious leaders, among others. Yes, the media, scientists and doctors, the government, NGOs and local players are all important when we talk about health communication. But the fact remains that there is a lot of information that is easily accessible to the bulk of the population through social media platforms. This is very often incorrect information, but is believed by many people. For example, we have released fact checks debunking the claim that steam inhalation is a guaranteed preventive measure and cure for COVID-19 by referring to reliable sources like the World Health Organization. But we see a lot of resistance to these fact-checks from users around the globe in the comments section who insist that we and the WHO are wrong and that steam inhalation is all we need to fight COVID-19. So, the question now is what can and should each individual do to ensure that they only engage with facts backed by science and reduce the presence of harmful misinformation in their lives. Right. So, let us take the example of steam inhalation that you had mentioned earlier. So, like I've said earlier as well, uh, people hold on to things that are easy, like they are always on a lookout for shortcuts. If this works, then well, why not try this as well? So, that is the mindset that people usually have that this might prevent or subside my symptoms, then why not try that? And in this era of information overload, it is very difficult to sift through the information. And this is where I think we have a lot to learn from the millennials. Like they are used to the information overload and like how the older generation say, for instance, how our WhatsApp groups are, uh, say our family WhatsApp groups are bombarded by information that is forwarded by the elders. The youngsters usually hold on to that saying that some things are too good to be true. So I'm not going to believe this. So it's very important that people take information with a pinch of salt. So there are a number of tips where you can become a little more informed and uh, you try and see for yourself how information has to be consumed. Say for instance, it's very important that you educate yourself uh, not in terms of like say understanding uh, scientific journals or reading them all throughout. Educate yourself in a way that you're not believing every information that you are getting on your uh, uh, phone on any media for that matter. It is very important that you recognize the emotion versus the fact. 
uh, well, the headline can be very attention grabbing or very uh, emotion saying that do this and it, it's going to cure uh, whatever illness that you have. You don't go by the emotion, but rather see what the fact is and if that has any evidence supporting it. And also, what is the source of the information that you are getting? See, by that, I don't mean to say that your family member has sent it. That does not make them the source. You need to try and trace it back to who the original source is and what do you do about it. And also, like, say, uh, a paper, uh, if you're reading a scientific journal, and it's important that who is funding it and uh, who the writers are. Say, for instance, there have been uh, examples like uh, smokers and vegetarians are, uh, uh, say, immune to COVID-19. It's uh, logically not very sound, but... And this is the time where you see who is the source and where is the funding coming from to understand if... To understand the truth in such a scenario where you are uh, looking at such scientific journals. And also, always pause before sharing. Think twice. See... If this is making sense, if it is actually going to help someone or put them through anxiety or if it's not going to help them, question it for yourself uh, whether the information is uh, true or false. See, one way to sift the right information from the otherwise information overload is to approach fact checkers whenever you have questions or doubts on a certain topic. See, let me give you a disclaimer here that fact checkers are not the know-it-all people. But rest assured, you will be provided with, say, a credible sources or a methodology and this will in turn act as a starting point on the evolving subject whenever something is in question. So, it's very important that you add this layer of responsibility before sharing and consuming information. It's a long process, but uh, I think this is the only way that we keep ourselves protected from fake news. A major fallout of all this information consumed on social media has been vaccine hesitancy. Several posts have attributed several conspiracies to the vaccine. Some say that COVID-19 vaccines will affect fertility, while others say that those who get vaccinated will die within two years of taking the shot. As a health communication expert, this is what Professor Vishwanath has to say about such worries. What I suggest is, let us figure out what are the underlying bases for those who are hesitating even when they get a chance, right? Is it just complacency, right? If it is complacency, we can push them over the edge, right, easily. On the other side, you know, say, yeah, I know. What will they tell you? They'll say, um, I'll get it next week. And I know, right? Um, so we have strategies for that. What we do is we make it easy for them to get it so that they run out of excuses. Let me give you one example. We can say once adequate number of doses are available in India, we can say, I will give it to you in your workplace. So you don't have an excuse to say, I have to go to a, a, a clinic and get it, right? I'll give it to you in workplace. I may come, I may have a mobile van. I'll come to your neighborhood, your com apartment complex and administer everybody, right? We can do that. We have done it. India has done it. The complacency part can be addressed. And then the misinformation part comes. The misinformation part could be two types, right? One type is it doesn't really matter because you still get it anyway, right? And for that, the message is for that group, it matters. Because even the, the number of people who are actually getting it is, is much smaller, okay? compared to people who are not vaccinated. So even up to you get it, it will reduce hospitalization. It will reduce severity of the disease. You know, it will help you. And then there is the third group among them, the hesitant group, which has uh, rumors, myths, folklore. And that's a group we have to observe very carefully and see what are these rumors and myths and then provide adequate information to continuously promote conscious thinking. You can't force them, but you can promote conscious thinking about how baseless their rumors and myths they have. Uh, and that, uh, so we have to be very strategic. There, you know, um, who do they trust as sources? Is it doctors? Uh, is it uh, actors and actresses, celebrities? Uh, is it, uh, in our case, I would argue, is it your neighbors and friends and family members? Because that's where the most powerful persuasion is. Family members and neighbors uh, are your colleagues. And then push it through them. And doctors. Doctors are always trusted. you know. And doctors. that's the strategy. 
So we are learning a lot about this pathogen. Every week we have new information on this pathogen, right? But the single important consistent message is get vaccinated. Don't worry. Don't worry what vaccine it is. Don't wait for Pfizer. Don't wait for Moderna. Uh, don't wait for Covaxin, Covishield, right? Just get it. Just get it. Because we know, number one, they are efficacious. Number two, even if you get COVID-19, the illness is not serious. It will reduce hospitalization. That's a single message. The sooner you do it, the better it is for you and your family. We Indians tend to be fatalistic about our health. Many of us who can afford health insurance don't take it because we think of it as money wasted on premiums if we never end up getting hospitalized. We don't wear masks when we step out during a pandemic because we think our immunity is strong from eating roadside pani puri in our teen years. And many of us don't visit the doctor even when we know that something is wrong with our body because we think that they will prescribe unnecessary tests to make money off us. The same goes for health related information. We accept unverified information from social media posts because we trust the person who has forwarded it to us rather than listen to experts who have spent years researching the topic. To all this, Professor Vishwanath gives this one fitting reply. If you are buying a product, you do a lot of research, especially if it's an expensive product, right? Uh, if you are buying a car in India, a scooter or a washing machine or something, refrigerator, you ask around. Right? You just don't go by ads. You ask around friends. You go to the showroom. You ask a ton of questions. You bargain with them. If you are going to do that for a product, don't you want to do that for health? Information that affects your health? Our last two episodes were about cancer. One of our guests, oncologist Dr. Vinay Deshmane, said that if there had been an easily available magic cure like cow urine for cancer, people across the world would be consuming it in large quantities. But this is not the case as this claim has not been proven true scientifically. The same goes for all the tall claims about COVID-19 and the novel coronavirus. If there had been a major breakthrough, it would come out in press releases by health bodies like the WHO, which would then be reported by mainstream media outlets and not on a social media post with no credible source line. Do remember that if something is too good or too ridiculous to be true, it probably is not true. It is up to each of us to engage with information intelligently and break the chain of misinformation. We can do this by looking up every piece of information we find online, especially from sources that lack credibility, and by actively engaging with fact-checking agencies when in doubt. We'll leave a list of vetted resource materials for you to read through in detail to get you started. Until next time, take care, stay safe, and remember... To Unviral. Unviral by Factly is researched by Nandita Kalidos, written, hosted and produced by Parvati Mohan and edited and designed by Jyoti Jiro. Thank you for listening.